Hello viewers, welcome to Renal taking you through the story for A level physics paper one. And this video I'm gonna go through the topic of radioactivity. So this topic is under modern physics and suitable for students in both senior five and senior six offering physics as part of their combination. So before we proceed, let's first look at the course outline for this paper. So physics paper one is divided into three parts. The first part is heat, where three questions come from these quests from these topics. The second part is modern physics, where three questions come from these topics, and the third part is mechanics, where four questions come from these topics. So in this video, I'm going to concentrate on this topic of radioactivity. Our interest is on calculations, but full notes can be got from this book. Mastering Elevo Physics Power 1, where clear notes, worked examples, and trial questions are found in the book of all the topics. But our interest will be on the worked examples found in this book. So if you need a copy of this book, contact the author on any of these two contacts. And a complete set of physics has three books. The first part, book is Physics Power 1. Physics Paper 2 and Physics Topical Question Bank. If you do principal math, there are also three books. One is Math Paper 1, Math Paper 2, and the Topical Question Bank. If you do sub math, it is only one book, Subsidiary Mathematics Paper 1, and the rest are for all level. So radioactivity is the spontaneous disintegration of an unstable heavy nucleus by emission of radiation. So the radiation can be alpha particles, beta particles, or gamma rays. So the emission disintegration is spontaneous. It, it can occur any time. Now, that was radioactivity. What about radioactive decay law? So we are interested in the calculations, but there are some terms which we need to understand, and there are some formulas which we need to derive. After that, we shall go to the questions. So the radioactive decay law states that the rate of disintegration is directly proportional to the number of active atoms present. So that is the radioactive decay law. It will be used to derive a certain formula of interest. So we shall consider capital N to be the number of unstable atoms present at any time t. And N naught to be the original number of atoms present at t equal to zero. So this is the initial, initially, before disintegration, this will be the original number of atoms. Now, this one will be the number of atoms after disintegration at any time t. Then, lambda is what we call the decay constant. Now, decay constant is the fractional number of disintegrations per second. So, it's the keyword disintegration per second of a radioactive sample. So from this decay law, we saw that the rate of disintegration is directly proportional to the number of at active atoms present, directly proportional to this capital N. Therefore, mathematically, we shall say the NDT, which is the rate, will be proportional to capital N. So from there, we can form a differential equation by putting an equal sign. So that was the proportionality sign. When we put a, an equal sign, we put a constant of proportionality. So our constant of proportionality is this lambda, which we have already seen that is the decay constant. And we also have this negative. Why is it negative? It is because as time increases, the value of capital N reduces. Remember, disintegration means this value of n keeps on reducing. 
So as T increases and reduces, that is why there is a negative. Now next is to solve that differential equation. So we, shall, we are going to first rearrange and then put integrals on both sides. When you rearrange, this n will come this side to become the n over capital N. And this dt will go this side to become negative lambda dt. After that, we shall put integrals on both sides. So integrals initially, when t is 0, the value of n is, is n naught, And at any time t, the value is capital N. So when I integrate 1 over N with respect to N gives me lean N. And this will be the, these are the limits. The integrate negative lambda. Remember, lambda is a constant. So when I integrate a constant, I get negative lambda T. And these are the limits. So those limits means we first substitute the upper limit followed by the lower limit. So whether it's this, I put there this to come up with this. Then substitute this here to come up with this. Here, substitute this here to come up with this. And this here to come up with this. So these natural logarithms work like logarithms. So subtraction means division. So when I combine the two under one lean, I'll get a division here because of that subtraction. Then here I remain with negative lambda t. Now to remove this natural log, I have to this side to bring this natural log this side it becomes an exponential so an exponential it means remember here when you say e that and e that this exponential and this cancels you remain with only this and this side becomes an exponential with that power so i believe you have already covered exponentials and natural logarithms in your mathematics. So next is to cross multiply and that will be the derivation you wanted. So this derivation is very vital. We shall be using it more frequently. So we are going to first derive the derivations then we can go to the questions. So that was the derivation for the number of atoms present at any time t. What about half-life of a radioactive substance? So half-life, denoted as t a half, is the time taken for half the original number of radioactive atoms to disintegrate. You know this word, time taken for half the original number of radioactive atoms to disintegrate. This means that when t is equal to t a half, then, then n is equal to a half n naught. Remember, this was the original number, but this half-life is the time taken for the original number to, dis to disintegrate to half. That is why there is a half n naught. Therefore, when you go back to our equation, 1, we shall substitute for t and for n. So this was capital N, we shall put there in half n naught. And here there was t, we shall put there now t a half. When you do that, you realize that this n not cancels, and here remain with a half, here remain with exponential of negative lambda t half. Now this is zero point, so put lean on both sides. So when I wanted to remove a lean, I put an exponential, meaning that when I want to remove an exponential, I will put a lean. So put a lean on both sides. To give you this, then you remember that this one cancels. Lean E cancels to remain with only this, which is here. Then here, lean this. When you use a calculator, lean 0 0.5 gives you negative 0 0.693. Therefore, when I make T half the subject, I'll come up with 0 0.693 over lambda. So this will be the expression which will be used to get half life of a radioactive substance. So you have seen so far two formulas, one for getting the number of atoms present or amount, or amount present and two, the half-life of a radioactive substance. Now what about activity? 
So the activity denoted by capital A over radioactive source is defined as the number of disintegrations per second of a radioactive sample. This is the number of disintegrations per second. So A let, let A B denote the radioactive activity of a radioactive source at any time T. Then A0 will be the activity of a radioactive source initially at T equal to zero. The activity will be the magnitude of dn dt. But we already saw that n is equal to, we already saw the expression for n, so come and substitute for it to come up with this. So we come up with dt, ddt here, and where there is n, we put there this expansion. So when I differentiate this, I'll come up with this expression. Remember, this n not is here, then differentiate this power to come up with negative lambda, which is here. Then write the whole exponential, write the whole of this exponential, which is here. So that's how they differentiate exponential functions. Now magnitude means what is negative becomes positive. That is why from here to here, there is no negative. But we know that n is equal to this and a is equal to this. No, implying that a is equal to that. So a, the whole of this, remember that if you look at this, the whole of this is this. Therefore, we shall again resubstitute it with capital N to give you this expression. Therefore, activity is equal to lambda N, where lambda is the decay constant and N is the number of atoms present. So similarly, initial activity is equal to lambda times a naught. So that has been the expression for activity. Now here, when we come and substitute for n and n naught, we shall come up with this. Now what we are getting, we are getting the expression to get activity at any time t. The other one, the one we got was activity in terms of lambda and n. What about when there is a function t? So where there is n, put there a over lambda. Where there is n naught, put there a naught over lambda. You realize that this lambda cancels to remain with a equal to n naught exponential negative lambda t. So this is the activity at any time t. That is the formula to use. Similarly, if they want the mass at any time t, still we shall just, where there is a, we shall put there m. So this is the mass present at any time t. This is the original mass, exponential, negative lambda t. So those are the formulas we need so far. Though there are others, but we shall first look at that, at those ones, then we go to the rest. So question 1 came from your name, 2004, paper 1, question 10c, Roman 2, and says... A radioactive isotope of strontium of mass 5.0 microgram. So this is micro. Micro means 10 to the power negative 6. Has a half-life of 28 years. Find the mass of the isotope left after 14 years. Assume that the decay law is this. So here they have helped you by giving you a hint. So the mass is this, multiplied by 10 to the power negative 6 to get grams. Half-life is that, T is that. So now here we don't need to change to SI unit. Remember, SI unit of time is seconds. But when these units are the same, there's no need to change. We just leave them as they are. If it is years, it should be years throughout. Months, it should be months throughout. Days, it should be days throughout. Hours, seconds, minutes, like that. There's no need to change as long as they are consistent. Now, in these questions of radioactivity, each time you see half-life, just know that you have to get the decay constant. So, decay constant is 0 0.693 over T a half. I think we saw that formula because what we saw was this was here and this was here. So, I've just rearranged. 
So each time you see half-life, just know they want you to get, you must get decay constant somewhere. So the first thing to do is to first get the decay constant because it will be used somewhere. So substitute for tier half and then use the calculator to come up with this. So it is advisable to use scientific notation. So it is per year because I think we see here the time is in the denominator. That's why you put per year. If this half-life was in minutes, we would have put per minute. If it was in hours, we would have put per hour, like that. So now that we have got the decay constant, we can cut the formula for mass at any time t. Then we substitute initial mass is this. Then exponential, lambda, we have got it. And the time is here, 14 years. So now use a calculator. I will still come up with this. So it is advisable to use scientific notation. Question 2 came from your name, 2018, paper 1, question 10, C, Roman 2, and says, A sample of wood was found to have, an, to have activity of 20 units due to carbon-14 isotope, whose half-life is this, 5 600 years if activity of wood just cut is this so that is the activity of fresh wood estimate the age of the sample now fresh wood means it was the activity at the time of cutting but after some time the activity reduced remember i think i see it it was 47 but after some time it reduced to this so this one, 47.8, is the initial activity that will be a note. And this one is the activity at present at time t. So that will be the value of a. So you are coming and say that a is 20 units, t a half is this, and this is the a note. So they want... Estimate the age of the sample. So they want the time taken, the time of the age of this sample of the dead wood. So, like I told you, each time you see half life, just know you must get decay constant somewhere. So, shall we begin with that? Decay constant is 0 0.693 over tier half. Substitute for tier half to come up with this per year because our half life is in years. Then we shall code the formula for activity at any time t. And then substitute. This was the dead, the one for the dead one. This is for the initial. Then decay constant we have calculated, and it is here which they want. Remember, don't forget this negative. Then when I bring this on this side, I'll come up with this side with this twenty over forty-seven point eight. And now this is the exponential. To remove it, I have to put lean on both sides. When I put lean on both sides, this will cancel to remain with this alone. And yet we we'll have now lean. The next is to make t the subject. I'll take this one this side with this negative. So this, this negative is what you see here. And this one is now the denominator. So when I use a calculator, I'll come up with a positive value, which will be the time they wanted. Or the age of the sample. Then question 3 came from your name 2015, paper 1, question 10c, and says, A radioactive isotope, this, which has a half-life of this days, disintegrates to form a stable product. A sample of the isotope is prepared with an initial activity, this, so this is a note. Calculate Roman 1, the number of P32 atoms present so initially present, that was the ones present at any time t, sorry, at time t equal to zero. Then Roman 2, the activity after 30 days, that is activity at time t. Then Roman 3, the number of p32 atoms present after 30 days. Assume this, so they're giving us a hint. So here the, we have half-life, which time you see half-life, it means you must get the decay constant so half-life is that activity is that 
in terms of days. So here, why are we converting? It is because I told you you don't need to convert if the units are the same of time. But now here we have this one is in days and this one is in per second. Therefore, one of it has to be converted in, in the other. But if you convert this one to seconds, it means even these ones we shall need to convert them. So the best thing to do is to convert this one unit, which is in seconds, into days. So that all the units we have are in days. But if you choose to convert this one in seconds, it means even this one has to be converted to seconds, even this one has to be converted to seconds, which makes the work longer. So that is why I chose to convert to per day. So Roman 1, when you see half-life, they need decay constant. So I come and get the decay constant, substitute for half-life, and get this as the decay constant. The inactivity is equal to lambda n naught. Therefore, initial activity, I have it. I've got the decay constant, meaning I can get the n naught, which is initially present, number of atoms initially present. And this will be the atoms they want. That was Roman 1. What about Roman 2? Roman 2, they want the activity after 30 days. Activity at any time t. Activity at any, at any time t, you have to first code the formula, which is this, then substitute. N0 is there. Exponential, then decay constant, we got it. And th time is 30 days. So you come up with this when you use a calculator. And that will be the activity they wanted. Then for Roman 3, Roman 3, they want the number of P32 atoms after 30 days. So P30, after 30 days, you can either choose to use this. There are two ways. You can choose to use this one because you have this N note, you have decay constant, you have the T. So you can get it correct. Or you can just choose to use this because you already know the the constant present, uh, sorry, the, you already know the activity present after a time after 30 days. So I can use this and substitute for activity and for the decay constant and remain with this as the unknown. When I make it the subject, I'll come up with the number of atoms they want. So n of the two is okay. You can use the formula for n in terms of t or you use this expression. So the questions you have so far seen involve half-life, number of atoms present, and also activity. But there are some questions in modern physics which involve in radioactivity which involve use of the Avogadro's constant. So what is this Avogadro's constant? It is the number of atoms or molecule present in one mole. Number of atoms or molecules, there can be atoms or molecules present in one mole of a radioactive substance. Not this word, one mole. So I've added another term, number of moles. And this value is a constant value. To you. It is always given in your examinations. So the first page of your examination will have this Avogadro's constant. There's no need to cram it. So if M is the mass of the radioactive substance present at any time T and capital M is the atomic mass. So capital M, it can be atomic mass if it's ato dealing with atoms or molecular mass if you're dealing with molecules. Of the radioactive substance, then the number of moles, which is small n. So remember capital N denoted the number of atoms present. Now, small n will denote the number of moles present in a given mass of radioactive substance. It implies that small n is equal to small m over capital M. Whereas, that means that number of moles is equal to mass of the radioactive substance over the atomic mass. Furthermore, if Na is the Avogadro's constant, okay, 
then the number of atoms capital N present in a given mass of reactive sample or substance is given by N equal to small n times N A. Remember why are we multiplying? Because this was this one, I've got this constant, was the number of atoms present in one mole. Now what if they are n moles? It means that the total number of atoms present will be number of moles times the Avogadro's constant. But we already seen that small n is equal to m over capital M. So when I substitute it, I come up with this. So this expression will be used more frequently in this part. And also this one. When that's for number of moles, use this. When that's for number of atoms, you can use this. So with those two formulae, we can go through these questions. Question 1 came from your name. 2012, paper 1, question 9c. And it says, a radioactive isotope, X99, decays by emission of a gamma ray. The half-life of the isotope is 360 minutes. What is the activity of 1 milligram of the isotope? So here, it means from this expression, you can get the atomic mass, which is here. It's always the one which is up, grams per mole. Then the mass, it was here, milligram. Milli means 10 to power negative 3. So you change it to grams, I'm applying by 10 to power negative 3. Then half-life is this, 360 minutes. So when you see half-life, always just know that there is decay constant somewhere. So even if you don't know the question, at least calculate the decay constant. So decay constant is this or half-life, so half-life, and get this per minute. It is per minute because half-life was in minutes. Therefore, the number of X99 atoms present can be got by this formula. This is the formula you have just seen. M over capital M times NA. So substitute for small m and also capital M and the Avogadro's constant. Use a calculator to come up with this and that will be the number present. So initially, the initial activity now will be, now we have got this n naught and we know the decay constant so we can get the activity. So the activity will be got by substituting decay constant and the number of atoms present to come up with this as the activity they wanted. Then question 2 came from your name. 2020 paper 1 question 8b Roman 2 and says the half-life of thorium or th30 is this seconds. Find the number of disintegrations per second that occur in one gram of thorium 30. So they are giving us the half life. It is here. Then the mass is given in grams. From this we can get the atomic mass which is 230 grams per mole. Therefore each time you see half life you, have, you must get the decay constant. So we will begin from there. Substitute for half-life and come up with the decay constant. So the number of thorium-30 atoms present, initially present, initially present, will be got by using that formula which we already saw. So substitute for mass, substitute for atomic mass, substitute for the constant to come up with this. Then therefore initial activity will be got by multiplying by Ramda times n, so ramda is that, decay constant, and n is that, to come up with this. And that's what they wanted, because they wanted number of disintegrations per second. And you already know that activity is the number of disintegrations per second. Then question 3 says, an isotope of bismuth of mass number 200, of mass number 200 has a half-life of this. It emits alpha particles with energy of this.
calculate the calculate for this isotope the decay constant Roman 2 initial activity of these moles of the isotope and Roman 3 initial power output of this quantity of the isotope. So first of all, because there is half-life, we have to get decay constant first. That's the first thing you remember. As long as you see half-life, just know decay constant has to be calculated. So substitute for half-life and come up with this as the decay constant. Then Roman 2, initial activity of these moles. Now they have talked about number of moles. So number of atoms will be n0 times equal to n small n of Gadra's number. So n0 is the number of atoms initially present. So these moles will come and substitute and you substitute the Avogadro's constant to come up with these atoms initially present. But they want activity, initial activity. Therefore we have n0, we have lambda. Therefore initial activity will be got by saying lambda n0. So lambda n note to come up with the initial activity. Roman 3, they want the initial power output of this quantity of the isotope. So initial power output will be equal to initial activity times the energy released. So initial activity is this, which I've calculated here, and the energy released will be this. It was given in the question. So we'll come up with this as the initial power output. So we have looked at Avogadro's constant. Now we shall go to what another term called unified atomic mass. So this is a twelfth of the mass of one atom of carbon 12. So we are interested in carbon 12. So one mole of carbon 12 has 12 grams. If you see carbon 12, it means grams per mole. So what it means that one mole of carbon 12 has 12 grams and these atoms. Remember, these are the number of atoms in one mole. Therefore, mass of one atom of carbon-12 will be this over the number of atoms to give you this. So this is the total mass for these atoms, but for one atom it means you divide by the total number of atoms to come up with that gram. So the unified mass, unified mass is U. When you see the U, it means unified mass. So 1u will be equal to a 12 of the mass of one atom of carbon 12. So I've got the mass of one atom of carbon 12. So this will be a 12 times, the, times that mass. So substitute for that mass and use a calculator to come up with this grams as the unified mass. But usually they want it in kilograms. So we are going to convert it to kilograms. So one kilogram is equal to a thousand grams. Therefore, one year will be equal to these grams divided by a thousand to come up with this in kilograms. So one U will, will be equal to this. But the good thing is that this constant will also be given in the question, so in the uh, under the table of constants. So there's no need to memorize it or to cram it. So that was unified mass. Another term will be Einstein's relation of mass and energy. So Einstein predicted that if the energy of a body changes from an amount E, its mass changes by an amount delta M, which is called the mass, de mass defect, given by the equation this. So this is the change in energy this is the change in mass, and this C is a constant, which is re referred to as the speed of light in virtue, C squared. 
where c is the speed of light in vacuum so it is always given its value is constant and will be given in the question so using the above equation unified mass can be expressed in terms of energy so let's see how energy of one u will be equal to change in mass times c squared so change in mass it was already given in kilograms it was this remember one u is equal to these kilograms and this c is speed of light in vacuum which is 3x18 but there is a square here which is we should not be forgotten that means that when i use the calculator the whole of this will be equal to this so in this topic it is advisable for the calculator to be in scientific notation so energy of one joule it will be equal to that but a joule can also be expressed in terms of electron volt so this one electron volt is equal to 1.6 exponent negative 19 joule it is also given the question in the constant so one electronic charge the value of this electronic charge is given in the whole table of constants. So when I convert these joules to electron volt, I'll come up with this expression. And then when I convert it to mega, I, that's why I divide by this. Add on this to, to, change, to, to convert to mega electron volt. So, sometimes, so this will also be given in the table of constants. So all these are constants. This one, the one we saw, unified mass is a constant in terms of kilograms and also unified mass in terms of energy is also a constant. So when, need, when they want you to use them, they'll give them to you in, your, in the question. As we shall see in these worked examples. So there's no need to memorize them. Another term is called binding energy. Remember, we are interested in calculations, but these terms will help us understand the calculations better. But if you want the notes, the notes are available in the books I told you to buy. So, binding energy is the energy required to split the nucleus into individual nucleons. So, it can be defined in terms of energy required or energy released. So, if I want to define it in terms of energy released, I would say it is the energy released when nucleons come together to form a nucleus so any of the two definitions are okay therefore that brings us to a term called binding energy per nucleon so binding energy per nucleon is the total energy required to split the nucleus of an atom into its constituent particles divided by the mass number of the atoms so that means that binding energy per nucleon is binding energy divided by the mass number of the atoms so with those three terms we shall go through these questions question one came from your 2010 paper one question 10 a roman three and it says so it was edited because in this question, this first part in, un in that year, they did not give this part. That is why I added the word edited. So in that year, it was not, uh, or it was not possible to, do, to attempt this question. So find the, find the binding energy per nucleon of ion 56, given that mass of ion 56 nucleus is this. U, U means unified mass. Mass of one at proton is that mass of one newton is that and one new is equal to that so this is what i told you that if they want you to use to check to convert unified mass to energy they will give you this if they want you to convert unified mass to kilogram they also give you the expression for kilograms 1.66 exponent negative 7 negative 27 so yeah they want you to get the binding energy per nucleon so ion 56, remember these ones, the one below, the one up is the atomic mass and this one is the number of protons. So when you add this, when you add number of, this atomic mass will contain number of protons plus number of newtons. Therefore, if I have this number of protons and I have the total, I can get the number of newtons by subtraction to give you 30 newtons. 
that will come and say that this one, this is the symbol for protons and this is the symbol for neutrons. So when I combine this, I'll come, so this ion contains these two. So when these two combine, they form ion. So 26 protons, that's why there is 26 here. And 30 neutrons, that's why there is 30 there. To give you one nucleus of ion. This E is the energy released. So I already know the mass of one proton and mass of one newton. So I can substitute one proton, one newton there. Then ion, I already know its mass, it is that. So this here, is a, is, where there is air, put their change in mass because now this line is dealing with mass. So add the whole of this left hand side to give you this. This right hand side is already there. Then make this mass, this is called mass defect. So make it the subject to come up with that. Okay. But you are given that one U is equal to this. Therefore, I can convert it to energy. Therefore, binding energy will be equal to this times 931 to give you this as the energy they wanted. But here, the after binding energy, they want you to get binding energy per nucleon. Remember, Binding energy per nucleon is binding energy over over the atomic mass. So atomic mass will be 56. That is why you put here 56. And this is binding energy. To come up with this MEV, this is mega electron volt per nucleon. So that was question 1. Question 2 came from UNEB 2014, paper 1, question 8D. Roman 2, it says... Calculate the energy in mega electron volt released by fusing four protons to form an alpha particle and two beta particles. The mass of beta particles is that, mass of hydrogen is that, and mass of helium is that, and one is equal to that in terms of energy. So they said you are fusing four protons. That is why there is four here. To get what? To get an alpha particle. This is an alpha particle. And what? And two beta particles. That is why there is two here. And this is the beta particle. This will be the energy released. So come and substitute four times this equal to this plus two times this. And here we should put mass defect. So use the calculator to simplify to come up with that. Then make M the mass defect the subject to come up with that. Then you remember that one is equal to that. Therefore, you can get the energy released by multiplying this times 931 to give you this. Then question 3 came from your name. 2011 paper 1 question 10D and says... A typical nuclear reaction is given by this. Calculate the total energy released by 1 gram of uranium. So these are the masses. So instead of using U, they use the mu because U is already here. So still we shall follow the same procedure. We are going to first write the equation she was given. Then substitute. This was for U, this was for N, this was for MO, this was for LA, this was for N, small N, and this was for the beta. You remember to add the mass defect. Then we shall use a calculator to simplify the left hand side, gives you this, and this right hand side from here up to here gives you this, plus the mass defect. Then make it the subject to come up with that. But one mu is equal to these kilograms. So that is, we are using kilograms because that's what was given. If you look at this question, they did not give us mu in terms of energy. They gave us it to us in terms of kilograms. So we shall get the mass defect in kilograms. After getting it in kilograms, we can use Einstein's equation, Einstein's formula. Therefore, mass released by one atom 
it will be mass defect times c squared. Come and substitute for m and c squared to give you this in joules. But that is for one atom. So how many atoms are in one gram? The number of atoms will be got using this formula. So mass, atomic mass, and Avogadro's constant give you this number of atoms. Therefore, I know the number of atoms and I know the energy for an atom, meaning I can get the total energy they want by multiplying to give you this. So that brings us to the end of this video. Thanks for watching and be reminded the next video will be on photoelectric emissions. So if you are not yet subscribed, please click on the subscribe button for this video so that you can see updates when the next video has been uploaded. And also, if you know any student who is not yet on this platform, please share the link of this video with them via social media platforms like Facebook and WhatsApp so that you can open